Welcome, ev Welcome everybody to the Oxford Martin School. For those of you who are coming for the first time, um, I would urge you to have a look at our website so that you can see the events coming up during term time. Before we start, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Um, please make sure your mobile devices are on silent. Um, and we aren't expecting to have a fire alarm, so if you do hear an alarm go off, you need to go out the way you came. Thank you. Coming to what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion uh, on inequality with two wonderful panelists. I'm Ian Golden, I'm the director of the Oxford Martin School. Uh, and joining me up here today are Katrine Marcel, I think, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes. <laughs> uh, who's a journalist and economics commentator who offers a feminist perspective on economics. Uh, her most recent book, which she'll talk to and which is available for signing. Uh, is Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? A story about women and economics. And this really challenges the question of economic man uh, that uh, Smith, of course, wrote extensively about and talks about the role of economics. Uh, Katrina is a leading journalist in Scandinavia. She does a weekly column for Scandinavia's leading newspaper. Uh, and uh, her book has been published first in all the Scandinavian languages uh, and in Polish. John Kampfer, many of you will know, is recently been announced as the director of the Creative Industries Federation. I don't know if he's going to be able to weave in uh, what that is into a discussion on inequality, uh, but it is a membership organization that really is going to represent the creative industries uh, widely defined uh, in the UK. So we wish you luck with that. It's an incredibly important job. Uh, he's the chair of the Turner Contemporary, which is a very effective cultural institution on the Council of King's College. Many of you will know him from his commentating, uh, writing, uh, not only in the Daily Telegraph first and the FT and BBC, but also as the editor uh, of Spectator. And if I was to read his full CV, it would take far too long and not enough time for discussion. But he's written many, many books. Uh, the most recent is... Uh, the one that he's got on his lap, uh, The Rich from Slaves to Super Yachts, which he will sign, and then previously also on Blair's Wars and Freedom for Sale. So each of them will take about five, six, seven minutes to introduce a series of questions which we've posed to them, uh, and then we'll have a conversation and open it up to discussion with you. And the questions uh, we've asked them to address are, first, is it morally justified to allow the creation of the super rich that leave the rest behind? Second, is the growing gap between rich and poor holding back economic growth and well-being? Third, could this be a cause of social unrest? And fourth, what can we do to address the gap between rich and poor? So, Katrina, why yes, don't you start? thank you. I'm very happy um, to be here. Last time I was in Oxford, I was a 13-year-old la annoying language student with a, <laughs> one of those backpacks. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, yes, so my book is about women and economics, and I will try to tie that into, into these, um, these questions. So first question, is it morally justified to create a class of super rich? Um, of course not. Um, money is power. Um, when too much po money and power is, is um, concentrated to a group of people, that affects democracy. And the question is plutocracy and democracy, can we combine that, is one of the, the big questions of, of this age. Uh, money is also psychology. In the ideology um, that underpins much of this, the idea that the rich are rich because they've earned it, and um, they are in some sense better than people who are not as rich. And uh, in that, we imply that poor people should look up to, to richer people, and this creates something in society that is not, not that, that moral if it's on the scale that it is um, today. Um, also, one of the basic ideas with modern democracy is that we all contribute. Uh, we all pay our taxes, we might moan about it, or we might not find all of them just, uh, but we do pay them. Um, if you look at the, the super rich, um, most of them don't, not to that extent. The, the richer you are within the 1%, um, the lower your, your um, effective tax rate. So it has already undermined what we call society and, um, and things that, that we find um, important. Um, also, when so many philosophers from Aristotle and all the way 
uh, talk about the importance of a strong middle class for, for democracy. And, of course, the squeezed middle and um, how the creation of this, this society of the super rich has undermined the middle class is something we, we talk about all the time. And that is also something that has to do with, with democracy. Um, another aspect which is not very often brought up when it comes to the super rich is that this is a, this is a very male group. Um, and it's, um, it is actually quite um, astonishing uh, and when you look at the figures. Here in Britain, it's just uh, on the Sunday Times rich list, it's 11% women. Um, and in the world, there are only 14 self-made uh, dollar billionaires who are women. Um, because most, most women who are on the Sunday Times rich list, and also if you look at the same statistics for the Euro area or America, uh, they are women who have inherited their wealth. So as widows and daughters, etc. Very few self-made um, millionaires and billionaires who are women. Even economists have, have been able to show that um, um, the more wealth that is um, uh, held by women, the slower economic growth. And this doesn't mean that the more um, that women uh, slow down economic growth by, by being rich, but uh, when um, you're in a slow growth environment, the main uh, way to get rich is to inher inherit money, and that's what women do. So that's an interesting uh, perspective that I would like to bring into it. Um, so is this growing grab holding back uh, the economy? Economies like Britain, uh, like the British one, which is, uh, and in Scandinavia we are moving in that direction, although from a much more equal uh, starting point, are becoming hourglass economies with lots of well-paid jobs at the top, lots of very insecure jobs at the bottom, and not that much uh, in the middle. And of course, that is not a very stable shape. It, it falls over. Um, um, we also know that um, er um, eras with uh, lots of uh, income inequality uh, seems to trigger financial speculation. When people have so much money they don't know what to do with them, they become less risk averse, and they bet those money on risky things, which then can threaten the whole, the whole economy. Um, and also, I mean, the basic thing, bringing it back to democracy, democracy, wealth, um, wealth exercises political power, um, trying to protect itself. Um, look at the very powerful financial lobbies, etc. And many of the what wealth, what wealth or wealthy people do then is uh, is things that undermine the competitive elements that make the market work economy actually work. So that is another economic problem um, uh, of the whole thing. And um, largely, um, just w what to, oh, the social unrest question. Can this create social unrest? Um, I think it can. I'm not going to sit here and predict, predict a revolution or not. That is a very, very risky business. And um, God created economists to make astrologers look credible. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave that to, to Russell Brand and, and other people who like to talk about revolution. But... Um, what to do about it, um, I think, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about this, there's lots of things you can do with, with the tax system, uh, make the super rich pay at the same tax rate on all their income, etc. The things that are also other things that have been suggested by Thomas Piketty, etc. and are, are being discussed a lot. I think there's lots you can do there. Um, I also would like to mention that I think it's important to change economics um, as, a, as a subject uh, um, and what economists focus on. When, um, when Keynes talks about, talked about the economic problem, he actually meant poverty, um, that people didn't have enough food, housing, all of these things. That was the definition of the economic problem. Um, that is not the definition of the economic problem today. That is not the main focus of economists. Um, and I think we need to bring it back there. And I think uh, lots of this sort of ideology that, that underpins this society of the of the one percent actually comes from comes from standard economic theory and and that that needs to to change um, and lastly I think we also need to have a quite fundamental political discussion and economic discussion about what what really matters in in our societies um, and then of course because I've written a book about women and economics I would push for the um, that we need to reevaluate things like like care um, and um, and th those things, and, and devalue other things which are too, too well paid uh, compared to what they actually, the value they actually create for, for the economy. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katrina.
Thank you. And first of all, um, I, I wasn't sure whether to be flattered or otherwise <laughs> to have been shifted from the New Statesman to the Spectator. Um, oh, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my, my counterpoint at the time was somebody you've never heard of called Boris Johnson. <laughs> um, and he went on to far finer things. Yeah. But anyway, um, and thanks, Katrina. Very nice to see, uh, to see you all here. I hope I'm going to answer the questions. But if I don't, um, then uh, obviously we'll in the conversations and um, in the Q&As. And in your reference um, uh, to women, Katrine, two quick observations. One is in my book, when I, which I'll, I'll set out in more detail in the course of this hour, uh, what I've been trying to do, which is to take 10 historical figures over the last 2,000 years and relate them to the modern day and the phenomenon of the super rich. Not a single one was a woman. Mm. Um, and I address that issue in my introduction by saying um, I'm doing this and I'm doing this knowingly because this represents history. Um, and I conjectured that maybe uh, if there is a follow-up in which I relate to uh, further instances of the modern day that uh, future um, Marissa Myers or, or other um, Silicon Valley um, uh, very uh, wealthy and successful people um, may uh, come into view. Um, the other quick aside is, some of you may have read this in the newspapers over the last week or two, apparently there are at the moment more um, people called John, who are CEOs of FTSE companies, than there are women who are CEOs. <laughs> um, so I've got a good chance, you see, one day. Um, I want to start, of all, uh, start first of all by um, uh, comparing uh, two quotes. Uh, one is a recent one, and one uh, is one that uh, figures in my book. The recent one uh, says as follows, there was a period of remorse and apology for the banks. I think that period needs to be over. Um, and the other quote um, uh, is from uh, 1772. Consider the situation in which the victory at Plassey had placed me. A great prince was dependent on my pleasure. An opulent city lay at my mercy. Its richest bankers bid against each other for my smiles. I walked through vaults which were thrown open to me alone piled on either hand with gold and jewels. This is the best bit. Mr. Chairman, at this moment, I stand astonished at my own moderation. <laughs> um, the first one um, is uh, Bob Diamond of Barclays addressing a um, select committee um, of the House of Commons a few years ago. Uh, the second is Robert Clive, Lord Clive, Clive of India, the man who made um, the East India Company and pretty much paved the way for the British Empire in uh, India, turning it from basically a bunch of uh, buccaneering tradesmen into the huge um, uh, geostrategic and, um, and money-making um, uh, empire um, of its time. Um, Robert Clive uh, died in uh, controversial circumstances. Did he kill himself or not? His uh, super wealth, which consisted, this is uh, in 1760, Burke's Annual Register, 1760, if you um, uh, relate it to inflation um, and purchasing power to now, his, his fortune then was 1.2 million in cash and, jewel, and jewels, um, plus 200,000 worth of jewels owned by his wife. And his annual income was estimated at 40,000 pounds a year, plus his tax collecting entitlement in Bengal basically the, the local leaders, um, just paid him off. He is one of the ten um, figures in my book. Um, I start with Marcus Licinius Crassus at the latter stages of the Roman Republic, uh, who developed a wonderful business plan um, in which he trained his slaves to be firefighters. Um, that's a sort of uh, early version of an apprenticeship scheme, I suppose. Um, and then mysteriously, all the buildings in the most densely populated part of Rome burned down. At which point, um, the uh, beleaguered residents were um, invited to sign a form which had them rehoused in another part of town. He then redeveloped the entire centre of Rome, housed all the senators and the politicians and people of influence at a cut rate. They were completely beholden to him, and he became one of the three most important um, people in, uh, in the Roman uh, Republic of his time. He also headhunted Julius Caesar, um, and he was... Um, a big rival of Pompey. He died, again, in mysterious circumstances um, on, um, on the fields um, uh, of uh, the Eastern Conquest in which he had molten gold apparently poured down his throat. Um, 
So, on to the, uh, onto the big picture. The question I ask myself when writing this book, and the last four chapters are all about the modern day, I look into the sheikhs, the geeks, the oligarchs, and the bankers, um, is this. Is anything we are living through now different to anything that has come before? And my very broad conclusion was no. This is consistent with history. Um, if you go back all the way through the issues around wealth, the acquisition of wealth, um, the way it is acquired by fair means or foul, by violence or by brilliance, by inheritance uh, or by appropriation, misappropriation or great business, this is consistent with history. The gap between rich and poor is consistent with history. I say this merely um, to state um, the facts. There are two phenomena that are of particular interest to this period that do not pertain to before. One is that this period follows one of the very few periods in history in which a concerted attempt was made by many governments around the world to smooth out the rougher edges of inequality. Um, now, it started a little bit earlier in the United States. Um, to all intents and purposes, we can say it started in 1945 at the end of the Second World War, and it continued to, through to either the advent of Thatcher or Reagan, or the Big Bang, so 79, 80, or the, or the mid 80s. Everything since then is reverting back to a past with which historians are much more familiar. The other fascinating uh, phenomenon of this day is not, I would contend, the difference, the gap between rich and poor. That has always taken place. It is the gap between the super rich mm -hmm. and everyone else. And that there is a fundamental difference. I wanted to call my book The Super Rich, and my editor said, no, I don't like hyphens. And, the rich in <laughs> and in any case, the rich encompasses more people, and you'll sell more copies. Um, but the phenomenon is fundamentally about the super rich. And that's where I, would, um, I wouldn't uh, take the issue of the 1% as your starting point. The 1% in British fiscal terms is anybody earning over 150,000 quid. Now, that to anybody on the average wage of 27,000 quid is a hell of a lot of money. If you're on 150,000 quid, you lead an extremely comfortable life of a decent home, foreign holidays, a nice car, uh, sending, if you, if you wish to, your children to, to private schools, um, and you can probably afford uh, uh, to support them in tuition fees and um, elsewhere in life. And, and really interesting work being done at the moment by The Economist and elsewhere about the links between privilege and education as a self-perpetuating um, elite. You are certainly not in a position to complain if you are on 150,000 quid, but you are nothing when it comes to what I call the global nomads, the super rich, who are the 0.1 and the 0.01%. And they are a hermetically sealed and very different and curiously fascinating, and I defy most people not to be in some ways fascinating. When the Sunday Times produces its rich list, its sales always go up. It's a very high discretionary sale, that, that issue of the year um, of the super rich. Look at uh, the FT's How to Spend It magazine, a massive seller, and not everybody reading it and buying it um, can afford to choose between three or four variants of, of private jets or, or super yachts. Um, so we are talking about a tiny group. These are people who have no fixed abode, and I'm not talking about people sleeping under the arches, they just have too many homes to count. Um, they spend time in uh, London, in New York, in Switzerland, on their yachts off Portofino or the Côte d'Azur, or skiing in Courchevel, or anywhere else they may have homes in, in the Seychelles or, or whatever else. They don't particularly have any national affinity. Um, they'll obviously pay uh, abeyance to their leaders, and if it's Russia and Putin, they'll, they'll be particularly um, in league. Um, but by and large, they relate only to each other. They are um, endlessly ultra-competitive. So they don't think, I'm on five billion, and look at that person I've just sort of, uh, uh, in my car with its tinted windows, I've driven past, um, you know, they're not. They simply say, damn, why is it that person I just met at the, this fundraising dinner last night is on 10 billion? I need to be like him. There is this ultra-competitiveness. And so when you look at the issues around taxation, 
when you start talking about issues of social justice, of um, inefficiency, and it is grossly inefficient to have this slew of super rich, because even they, after a while, tire of ways of spending their money. There are only so many super yachts and planes and cars and homes that you can have. So you actually have a hell of a lot of money swilling around doing nothing. So in pure economic terms, it is efficient. They don't think in social justice terms because they don't meet anymore people like you and me, like um, ordinary folk. They are literally um, uh, behind gated communities, gated walls, and the whole issue is to get from 5 billion to 10 billion to 20 to 40 to 50, and you will do whatever it takes, and whatever it takes all invariably revolves around um, uh, avoiding tax, whether it's aggressive uh, tax um, uh, avoidance or whether it's tax evasion. The difference is only whether or not you have a good accountant. Um, the, uh, so the whole question of an interrelationship with the rest of society doesn't pay. And I'll probably stop there because I'm being told to stop. Um, and, I'll, and I'll leave it like that. And I will relate uh, later on, um, if, uh, if you wish, uh, to the whole psychology of the super rich and why the phenomenon we are dealing with now is so hard to deal with. Um, and one final point, um, the, uh, to look for answers to the modern day super rich um, look no further than the English 19th century ph philosopher Herbert Spencer, who was extremely close to Darwin. And he had an, a, a very compelling view, and he was always being fated in New York by the robber barons um, of the time, that there is a reason why you, dear friends, Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and the like, are rich. There is something intrinsically smart and clever about you. Um, Carnegie created a, an essay called The Gospel of Wealth, which I'd like to talk about um, later on. It is perhaps the single most interesting thing ever written about uh, wealth creation and, um, and what you do with it. And it is the Bible now of Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and many other modern day super rich. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so we have... Uh, sort of very wide canvas that we can have this conversation on. Um, let me maybe just begin by, by pushing two questions. And I, I think I was hearing different things, and I certainly think different things. We have uh, over 40 people in the Oxford Martin School working on these issues of inequality and, and growth, so doing a lot of research and also on how technology is replacing jobs, which impacts on this, and demography aspects as well, which impact on this. Um, I think I heard you saying that it, basically the data are showing that it hasn't changed. Um, I think I heard you saying that it is getting worse. Um, and certainly the data that I've seen from uh, our own teams of researchers and from the OECD, uh, even from the IMF, uh, suggests that inequality is growing. So can I just tease this out a bit? Oh, is society becoming more unequal? Uh, is that a reflection of just the super rich getting richer? Or is there something else happening here? Katrina. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, I would agree with you about the data. Um, I, I, th I think what you were trying to say was that we should m more look at the, the period, sort of the post-war period as, as something. That was, that was the, um, um, that was not normal. Um, um, but, um, I mean, some of it has to do with, with globalization. I mean, some of it will be, will be normal. Look at, I mean, J.K. Rowling would sell more books than Charles Dickens because she has a global market in a way that Charles Dickens didn't have. Uh, so she would, she would get, get richer, um, but, but that would only account for a very small part of it. And I think um, to really understand it, you have to look at how these, these groups uh, protect themselves, protect their wealth, uh, exercise political power, etc. And I think m m m a lot of the answer is, is, to be found, is to be found there not in sort of looking at how the, the markings of the market. And one constant seems to be that women have remained not super rich. Exactly. That is, <laughs> over that is long a, that periods is a of constant, time. Exactly. But then it's even more of a problem because the super rich are getting, I would argue, even more powerful in this age. And because the super rich are still not, there's still not a, almost a, not any women there, it's becoming even more of a, of a gender problem. John, have I misinterpreted you? Um, well, I, I, th I think so, um, only in that 
obviously, I mean, the Gini coefficient is obviously the, the measure uh, or one of the measures um, of, of wealth, and it's useful to look at uh, both the Gini but also to look at each decile, each group of a tenth of, of, of any um, population. Um, the Gini has uh, moved backwards. I mean, it has, it has increased. Wealth inequality has increased massively since 79 mm -hmm. and onwards. The point I am trying to make is that we spend all our time comparing uh, the situation as we find it now um, with the post-war more interventionist um, period. Um, and that if you, uh, I, I cite quite a lot of um, inequality stats insofar as they are translatable over periods and over, uh, you know, we should talk about the Roman Empire if you're talking about um, early medieval Malian kingdoms um, to the robber barons via um, Renaissance Florence and Cosimo de' Medici and, and, and all the chapters in, in my book. The genie that we are faced with now, in very broad terms, is pretty similar to the genie if you can measure it for those mm. earlier terms. And I suppose the interesting thing is then that, and that is today when we have all this ideology and all these ideas about equality and, mm. and equal, equal rights and, and all of that, which, which they didn't have in, in Roman times, for example, but, but the actual out, outcome is, is, is similar. So that's interesting. But the other point, I just, it'd be interesting if, if others wish to, to flesh it out, is, and I think this is what gives this era a unique quality. It is the, gr the increasing and quite clearly discernible animosity between the middle class and the super rich. Mm. There has always been a rich, poor divide. That, that goes through history. The bottom 10% uh, um, always are on, on the brink of, of, of poverty, deep struggling, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. All the way through, there has always been um, a resentment, understandably, by people who are struggling uh, towards people who are doing quite well for themselves. The interesting thing now is you have that as well, but you also have the people doing reasonably well for themselves, but not as well as they used to be, and their resentment of the 0.1. And this phenomenon that is increasingly discussed now, this being the first generation, my, my generation, um, of, uh, of parents who absolutely now do not work from the assumption that their children will be better off mm. than them. And that is a, an entirely new um, phenomenon and the shrinking of opportunities for, uh, it might sound oxymoronic, but I don't think it is, for the ordinary <coughs> middle, middle class. It, it, I mean, it's interesting your, your long-term comparisons with other parts of the world, Roman Empire, Mali, and other places you've cited, because the data I've seen seem to suggest that the most rapid rise in inequality has been in emerging markets. Um, so China, obviously, very rapid rise, uh, but also in India, Brazil, Brazil's very high, uh, yeah. and South Africa, many, many, yeah. many places. And, uh, and this touches on the point you made about globalization. <laughs> And whether there's something about globalization, which you know, it's a period that's over the last 25 years since the Berlin Wall fell and the world is hyper-globalized, that's, that's leading to this increased inequality. Well, what you had um, in, from the 80s onwards was three phenomena which I, I look at in my book that started to happen at the same time, and they were interlinked, and they were partly causally linked as well. You had, uh, to coin uh, Fukuyama's phrase, the end of history, you had the end of or so people thought, ideological difference. You had the supremacy, so politicians um, proclaimed then in the 80s, of a single world view of, of free markets. Alongside the advent of technology and instant capital transfers, alongside globalization. And if you put all three together, mm. they propel each other. Yeah. And all sorts of economic and financial yeah. market changes. So the other question, of course, is does it matter and what can we do about it? Um, do you want to sort of, why does it matter um, that there's rise of quality? You, you touched on the political point and political capture, mm -hmm. which I think is incredibly important. Society, democracies get corrupted yes. by inequality, uh, and maybe the US is the best example of, of lobbying power, and particularly industries obviously can confirm that. Um, but is it... Is there any evidence that growing inequality has led to revolution anywhere in the world? <laughs> well, uh, in, 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 in modern times. I'm not a historian, <laughs> uh, so I, I don't think I'm the right, I think probably you're, you're a better person to, 
to answer that, but um, uh, I can ask something else about globalization. But why, okay, <laughs> so then this is, why, why don't you talk about how it corrupts democracy? Well, I mean, it's just, I mean, as I was trying to say, it's not just democracy, but there's also economy and growth, because yes, yes, it, it corrupts democracy by, by these groups capturing power and, and uh, making power work for their own interests, but that actually makes markets work less well, because um, it, it ruins, or it, or it tries to ruin, for example, by, by lobbying against transparency in the financial sector. So that would actually make many markets work better, but because these groups that are already very wealthy have an interest of, of not having more transparency, they will use their lobbying power um, against that. Uh, they will be very successful, especially in this country, when it comes to these issues. Um, and and it, will, it will have an effect not just on democracy, but also on the things that makes, makes mar market, markets work. Uh, and I think that is an important point to make as well. And the other point I made was about uh, financial speculation, that was touching on, on what, what John was saying about that these super rich are so rich, so they don't know what to do with their money, and they, they bet them on these very risky financial projects, and then that brings down the whole economy, and then... Um, someone else has to have to pay for it, which in many cases are uh, women in low-paid jobs. Um, and um, that's the, the gender structure of the whole thing. It's funny, when, you, when, when I contemplate the sort of the social repercussions, the potential to, to violence or, or to dislocation, I, um, I give two different answers on two different days because I can never really work it out in, in my head. The, the more pessimistic, nothing will change worldview uh, that I quite often have revolves around the fact that um, what has happened since the crash? Well, the answer, not a lot. Um, a certain amount of regulation at the edges of the financial services um, sector, even that leads to a huge amount of self-pity and squealing. Um, um, you have, uh, there is uh, very little evidence that it is changing um, uh, the political uh, scene. Now, there is in Greece, there is in Spain. To what degree will that be more than, you know, um, a one-hit wonder? In other words, to what extent will, um, will the Greek government uh, really initiate change? Uh, you have a history of uh, more radical left French governments that start off in that way, and after a year, when their currency goes through the floor and the markets go through the floor, they always change because they basically give up um, the battle. And uh, so, therefore, nothing much changes, egged on by the fact that now, uh, although absolutely unevenly felt and unevenly distributed, there are the greater signs of growth uh, in Europe and around the world. So that's the argument, that's the sort of the anesthetic argument that nothing much will change. The other argument is there is a, a evidence, if anecdotal, of a change in corporate behavior in some, that <coughs> quarterly reporting is changing, that the, the sense of uh, research and development um, is increasing, and also a sense of if you are consumer facing, you need to, be, to behave a bit better, which is more than CSR, more than corporate social responsibility. It is a change, and there's quite an interesting set of, of CEOs in corporate land that, that are beginning uh, to do more than pay lip service to, to better behavior. But being much more of a half-empty than a half-full person myself, I do err on the side of the former. But that said, um, I see no evidence, her famous last words, of a big social upheaval. And if that was going to happen, it would have happened very shortly after mm. the crash. Mm. Mm. I, I think... Um, I mean, I, I also am, am not convinced by social upheaval. And what's remarkable about fundamentalism, of course, is that it tends to be very middle-class people who, who are the, uh, the most dangerous people. But um, you, I'm, I'm, I, I see in the UK and across Europe and in the US growing inequality uh, leading to a fragmentation of, of social cohesion uh, mm -hmm. and the rise of parties who are xenophobic, nationalist, protectionist. Um, and a change in the nature of democratic politics, uh, which I think is partly attributable uh, to inequality. I don't know whether you'd yeah. share that. Yes, I, I think, obviously, we, we live in that kind of time, but in, in another sense, it's not, it's not that simple. We have, if you, if you talk about xenophobic parties, so there's been a lot of that kind of discourse in, for example, in Norway, which has 2.5% unemployment and have a, a party of a 
with sort of definite xenophobic populist tendencies in government being being very big, and then you have countries like like Spain or or Portugal, which where you would right now expect a very very big force like that, and you don't really see it see it like that. So I mean, I I don't have have the answers uh, uh, to that, but I, I'm more of a half full than half <laughs> empty um, person. So I think there has been a big change, in maybe not on the streets, yes, there was the, the Occupy movement, and, but I think within the, I mean, the fact that we are here having this, this discussion, I think since the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, certainly within economics, I, I feel that lots, lots have changed. I think also in the political discussion, that, that story that used to be very powerful, that, oh, we don't, have, we don't care if, if people get filthy rich, and we don't have to care about inequality as long as there's social mobility. Um, that one has definitely lost its, its power and also we can, we can show now that in, in data that this idea of the, the American dream, um, that you can be born poor and, and rise up and, and make something better for your life, that is the American dream is most common in Denmark um, because, um, and not, not in America. This is Scandinavian countries have higher social mobility than, than America. So, there is, so there's, there's almost no such thing as a society with very high levels of inequality that at the same time manages to have high social mobility. The two things go together. And I think that is an interesting change, which I think will affect policy and, and is already maybe affecting policy. And Denmark has one of the lowest inequalities in the world. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Let's open it up. We have about 20 minutes uh, left. Yeah, the gentleman over there. Sorry, Sorry could you wait a, for the microphone? Mic. Yeah. <laughs> In, in, in Oxford, in this rarefied atmosphere, analysis goes on ad infinitum. When do you think we would be at a state of critical mass where people would really be upset? If we lived in a village and a neighbor across the green was either starving or ill, we would rush to help them. Now, it seems to me in there, th there's embedded something that would draw attention to the gross problem. And I don't think raising women to the status of billionaires is the solution. Didn't say that. <laughs> okay, we're gonna collect a few <laughs> questions. Do, do keep them in mind, please. Um. Uh, it follows on from what this gentleman said. Uh, I've had a simple idea for a long time, if you please comment on it. Why can't international bodies such as the IMF appoint a trustee for each of the wealthy 50, 50 billionaires in the world whose net assets are about one and a half trillion and have like a 15 year program where they are publicly named and shamed with the support of all governments whereby they have to adopt a project of, you know, a, approved by an international body. It might be dealing with malaria, education in a third world country and they have to liquidate 80% of their liquid assets over say 15 years to fund these projects. They'll, they'll get a lot of kudos for it, and so otherwise they can be named and shamed. You know, if you want direct action, we have a head of a major you know, university department here. P please take this idea and give me a footnote if it gets adopted. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Simon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. yeah, one more, yeah. In, in 1900 in the US, a, a man went to the farmlands with another guy and he said, 90% of our population now work in farms. In 1950, 3% um, work in other occupations. In 1950, only 3% of the population will work in farms. So the guy said, well, what happens to the other 97%? And he said, I don't know. And I feel it's similar today. When you look at Google and Twitter, they don't hire that many people. Pinterest got sold for a billion dollars more than the value of General Motors, it had 14 people that it hired. So I see a major change occurring there, in, and they're talking about it technologically. And one other comment I'd make, there's a guy who runs a program called Sugarland. There are a bunch of professors. I don't know if you have a very interesting program. It's a trading program where they um, took in about the ability to hire using computers, to inherit, to hire, to trade, and so And it said when they did this, and they ran it for hundreds of generations, they always had crashes very similar to what's happened economically here. And it always happens, going back from Rome beginning, that when you look at our society, the money increases, then the system crashes, then it starts again, then the system 
it's like it is today, and then it crashes again. Mm -hmm. And this has periodically happened mm -hmm. throughout history. And their computer program seems yeah. to validate that again, and it's just like built into okay. our DNA. Let's, let's take these three, and then we'll uh, hopefully get to, to all of you. Don't spend too long on the, on the response. Great. Okay, yes. Uh, no, I'm, thank you. Um, I don't know about the critical mass, but I, I was certainly not saying that more female billionaires would, would solve this, this problem. I was trying to, to point out the fact that we have a group of super rich, almost you know, 99% male, um, that becoming more and more powerful in the global economy at the same time when 70% of the world's poor are women, and that that is not a coincidence. Um, and that this, this story about inequality is also a gendered story. And I think, and that's what I'm, I argue in my book, it has a lot to do with what we value and don't value. We put a very large value to what the financial sector does and almost no value to, for example, care work. And, um, and, and, and that is, that, that's, that's part of the story about inequality. And that, that was the point I was, I was trying to make. Okay. Uh, sorry, just, I, I'll answer a couple of points. I'm just desperate to give this one quote because I think it helps to illustrate some of the things. And uh, do volunteer anybody who'd like to say who said it and who he was referring to. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, a clue. It took place in Canary Wharf in April 2004. I would like to pay tribute to the contri contribution you and your company make to the prosperity of Britain. Um, doing, during your 150-year history, you, I put in the gap there, have always been an innovator financing new ideas and inventions before many others even began to realize their potential. Gordon Brown? Gordon, Gordon, Gordon Brown. Brown. Gordon Brown said it to <laughs> Lehman Brothers. Lehman. <laughs> um, when he was opening their European um, HQ, Gordon Brown also said at one point, it was a patriotic duty to go shopping. Um, <laughs> it's true, because um, it creates, it creates so growth. Um, the, I think when we talk about uh, inequality and the anger, I, thought, I think we, we as a nation um, uh, uh, and as, as people need also to be, I think to maybe, anger is easy. The question is, needs to be a far more uh, deep-rooted, self-critical policy analysis of why we are in the situation we are. The entire last 20 or 30 years have been fueled by consumerism and fueled by a social prioritization towards the acquisition and the dispensing um, of money, whether it was on the Never Never or, or, or whatever. Um, your point about care professions and the, the wrongful prioritizations is an entirely good um, and valid one. But I would argue that we haven't even begun to have this conversation. Who do we... So, do we think that, we think obviously bankers, bad, people uh, not paying their tax, bad. What do we think of the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs? Absolutely, Ian is much better qualified than, uh, than others to talk about the uh, low intensity labor, everything becoming computerized technology, and, and the fact that we've only just begun to start losing work to, to technology and to um, automization. But what do we think of footballers? Mm -hmm. um, you know, these people on 150,000 quid a week, um, you know, no wonder they get into so much sort of fueled problems, not being able to buy cars as quickly enough as, as they can spend it, and then they go to sort of nightclubs and then they behave badly and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, we haven't even begun, and they are worshipped by ordinary, usually young men uh, and some women um, as role models. What do we think of our film stars and our celebrities? Um, we are confused, and we, I think we need to recognize that we are confused, because simply saying it is bad and, and holding up uh, Fred the Shred and all these people as sort of cardboard, cardboard cutouts uh, is all true and valid, and, and uh, I, I would subscribe to all of that. But I would also argue it's only the beginning of the debate about how do we order society. Most people, one would think, think that entrepreneurialism is a very good thing, and that if you can build a business and, and develop a, a product in a way that benefits society and at the same time do well for yourself, as long as you pay your taxes, um, and hopefully you contribute in other ways through philanthropy and whatever else, that's a good thing. 
but we're all, I would argue, we're, we're, we are, um, we're, we're, we're quite confused. Just one small thing. I did say I would mention Andrew Carnegie and the Gospel of Wealth. Do read it. Do, do, it it's a fascinating thing. It's, it's the, the first bit, it's only 20 or 30 pages. The first bit is all standard um, Anglo-Saxon economics around low-wage low uh, labor costs, uh, high profitability, make money, how you make money quickly. There's the classic free market mantras in the, in the late 19th century. The really interesting bit is what you do when you become rich. Um, and he was very much of the view, and he, he, uh, there's a quote in it which says, he who thus dies rich dies disgraced. Um, his argument was that as soon as you make all this money, and you must be brilliant because you made all this money, there must be something genetically amazing about you, um, then you must start getting rid of it. And you don't just get rid of it in your will, good enough, good enough though that might be, that will be a sign of failure. You must get rid of all of it, or almost all of it, by the time you're dead. And that's a really interesting thing. He was talking about really low uh, income tax, really low, I don't know if there was corporation tax in those days, but really low tax in your lifetime, and 100% inheritance tax which is a really interesting phenomenon. Whereas, when George Osborne and David Cameron announced <coughs> before the last election, 28, 27, 28, this idea of lowering inheritance tax, even though very few people are eligible uh, or would benefit from it, it was, according to the opinion polls, one of the single most popular measures. Um, in other words, you may, not, it may, you may not have it, but it's one of the great aspiring things to be able to leave money to your kids. So you've got two completely different things going on here, and I just think it's interesting that we need to drill down a little bit more on the detail. Let me just quickly pick up on a couple of the questions that weren't answered. Um, Simon's point about uh, taxing uh, at 80% um, the billionaires uh, and someone doing it. I, mean, I think it's an admirable, and, and, and you know, the Oxford Martin School where we're sitting is the result of someone giving away 80% of their money. Uh, uh, and before he died, tragically, a year ago. So um, people do it, but forcing them to do it, and then the issue is compliance and international law. And mm -hmm. that's where dodging, and where places mm -hmm. like Monaco and yeah. Liechtenstein mm -hmm. and everyone, none of these people are tax registered in any of our countries. Uh, and even if they were, um, they, there's all sorts of and exclusions. And Britain has more, more offshore jurisdictions uh, than any course, other which country. Which is why it has such a high share of billionaires resident here. Um, so th I think the issue is the political will uh, of our societies to really clamp down on this, and I'd, I'd be completely behind that. This question on technology and employment, the only thing I'd say is encourage you to look at the most recent report that the Oxford Martin School has produced, and the, there should be free copies, I think, uh, around, but certainly on our website, freely downloadable, on called Technology at Work, where we were predicting, <laughs> thanks, uh, <laughs> Katrina, uh, <laughs> that 47% of jobs will be lost to machine intelligence over the next 20 years. So this is a very serious revolution, different to the agricultural revolution because of the speed, and also different because of the people that are being replaced are not just unskilled, but also middle-income people. Mm -hmm. And this goes to mm -hmm. the point that John was yeah. making about the, the hollow, uh, hollowing out of the middle. We're gonna have time for one more round, so a lot of quick questions and quick responses. The gentleman over here. Hi, thanks. Um, the question about the billionaires. Um, so we land blast them. We think that uh, they're not worthy of the money that they have. But what about uh, corporations? Apple, for example, about to be worth a trillion um, dollars. Uh, what's their effect on society and these issues of politics? Yeah. Okay. Um, woman in the front, woman behind you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be the one percent of women <laughs> asking a question. Uh, I, this is really uh, directed at John. Um, you said that after the war, uh, parents had aspirations for their children and there was free education and health care. And so people had these aspirations and, and we developed a, a community that more or less became the first now where most people assume they're going to leave something to their children in their wills. But all of a sudden, in the 80s, uh, this seemed to disappear. And can you explain how this greed then started, having got on this lovely plane where we were actually beginning to share things, that all of a sudden we've got this incredibly greedy, and without being at all political, um, just a quick one, is it right that we are governed by a very privileged and wealthy group of people? Okay, 
the woman behind you. And then <laughs> it's my question relates slightly to, to the last one, which is, um, to what extent do you think the distortion and manipulation of house prices is being used as a sort of national tranquilizer placebo yeah. on the middle class to make them feel rich so that the super rich continue to get away with their elite behaviors? That's next year. Hi, um, I just wanted to really comment on your um, notes about you know the lack of value placed on caring professions and the sort of professions that women have traditionally occupied. And to some extent, I feel that a lot of the discussion around um, going on from equal opportunity to things like you know now having to publish how many women are in certain positions in each company, etc., slightly missed the point that. Um, as long as you have equality of opportunity, there are a lot of those roles that women don't want to take, not because they don't aspire or because they are not capable, but because their values are different. And what we really need to shift at is, is looking at the values that women have and why they don't take their roles, and then re-establishing the, the, the worth placed on them. Um, a rather different question. What, what do you think that uh, Europe's most powerful woman in charge of its richest country should be doing to help the impoverished and distraught women of Greece? <laughs> yeah, I'm very do good. Do you very good. think that her country's present approach to the people of Greece is correct, even bearing in mind that many of the extremely wealthy men of Greece have failed to pay their taxes and continue to fail to pay their taxes. Are they currently helping and empowering the women of Greece or are they punishing them? Okay. Oh, I, Do you want to respond to, to those, uh, Yes, so yeah, the care. Um, the, the care so, so my book is called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? Uh, because who cooked, um, the founding question of economics is how do you get your dinner, which is the question that Adam Smith asks in The Wealth of Nations. And his answer is the famous, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher or the baker that you get your dinner, it's through them serving their own self-interest. And from there we have the big economic story of self-interest being what keeps the economy going. It's like, it's like gravity in the economic universe keeps everything together. So I start my book by looking at Adam Smith's life um, and he, um, he never married, but he lived with his mother his whole life. Uh, and she, she looked after him. Um, and so maybe, I ask, she had something to do with the fact that his dinner ended up on the table. Uh, and did she do that out of self-interest, or did she do that out of something else? Love, obligation, all these things that we don't um, look at in economics. Um, and, sort of, and from there, I sort of look at the story of, of economic man, the central character of, of the economic story. And one of the chapters is called, uh, which I think um, is about your point, uh, is that you can't just add women and stir. Um, and in many, <laughs> ways, in many ways, this is what we've done. We have, we have a labor market which is based on this idea of this rational, self-interested man out to, to make more money. Um, and then magically, his whole home life is going to be looked after by his mother or his wife or somebody else. And labor market is based on that. And then we, some, in some way, added women and stirred. We said, well, please c go out in the labor market and compete in the same way as men do and try to be in the 1%. Um, and it doesn't work. And it creates these massive tensions in society, in the economy, and, and within women themselves. And then we tell women to solve it by being, you know, sort out your handbag, do more yoga, meditate. <laughs> and, and, uh, but it really is an economic question. So I, I completely agree with you. And I think that is, a, that is a discussion that we need to have. And it's a very, very fundamental question because it goes all the way back to at least to Adam Smith and, of course, even, even further than that. Um, should I do Michael as well? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, 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 the, the interesting story, one of the interesting stories with women in Greece is, is how they're getting after the, going, try, the government is trying to go after the, the church and the money that the Greek Orthodox Church might have hid from, from, um, from the tax, uh, tax authorities in Greece. And, and that, I think, would, if they can prove that, that would really outrage the old ladies of Greece. And that, then you'd have one of those moments when you actually would have a, a revolution. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Merkel, I mean, what she could do, I mean, she could... 
this, you know, Greece is not going to be able to pay off this debt. There has to be another deal. And uh, I mean, people are have been saying that for a long time. And I hope hope Germany um, will listen to that. Another thing she could do is is um, she could uh, she could raise wages for for German workers. She could you know build childcare in Germany, which would enable German women to come out to work and and pay taxes and spend. So you can get um, um, the German. Uh, uh, the Germany would consume more, which would also help to stabilize the European economy. So there's, there's lots of things she can do. And, and nowhere in my argument is it that, you know, because she's a woman, she, this is a certain kind of politics. Um, uh, but um, uh, so, so, yes. John, three minutes. <laughs> uh, right, well, I mean, the, uh, a huge amount of really, really good questions. And, and there were three questions here, which probably uh, uh, take as a... Um, as a cluster, the, the remark about housing, I think, is a really, really interesting one. I hadn't ever framed it um, like that before. Um, and, and I'm sure there's merit in, in, in that remark. I mean, the, the British housing boom or bubble is the most economically absurd phenomenon from which a small but not insignificant number of people are benefiting hugely. There's a total divorcing between income and assets. So you could be earning X in your house if you're living in London or the, or the South East, and a place like Oxford very much fall into that. Um, your, your, your house prices bear no relation if you've certainly lived in them since the late 80s or 90s or whatever. Um, and that completely distorts the market. It distorts uh, the possibilities um, for your children. Uh, in terms of if you've, you know, if you if you've got property, you can then uh, hand it on, and that gives them a nest egg, which your income won't necessarily give you. At the same time, does it dull the senses about being angry about what is going on? You bet it does. Anything does. I mean, consumerism is the anaesthetic for the brain. I mean, it is, it is what stops people from um, uh, from really seeking change. And I think the values agenda that that um, that w was, was elsewhere discussed, I think, is fundamental. So, so the Thatcher, I, I, I was here uh, at Oxford. I graduated in 84. Um, I took a path that led me into journalism and, and uh, the arts and the creative industries. And I've had a wonderful time and uh, haven't complained about anything, or at least I shouldn't. Um, uh, and I've just earned a decent life. Those people I knew who went straight into financial services or went for the big four, you know, they put themselves immediately just on a completely different graph. It was almost a life choice. Um, and that was not facilitated, because it's always been the case, but that was massively enhanced by, it, and you could use the single word Thatcher, um, but it is the phenomenon that she reflected at the time, which was just unleash this so-called potential. Now, of course, you know, uh, there was some great potential that needed to be unleashed, and there were some barriers to enterprise that needed to be unleashed, but, you know, the law of unintended consequence um, led to social dislocation uh, and also led to casinos rather than uh, a strong financial services sector. But I, again, I come back to it's very easy to blame politicians. Uh, it's much more difficult and much more searching to, to, to uh, question ourselves and society for our own, um, for our own values, and you know, don't forget that no matter what we thought of, of of her, she reflected a zeitgeist, and she did do. You know, she was elected. You can quibble about the electoral system, but but she did, and that there were 13 years of a Labour government, and the minimum wage in its first week was great, and one or two other things it did were, were quite brave and, and, and radical. But fundamentally, it didn't change the dial at all. Now, why did it not do that? Is it because it was frightened of the markets? Um, was it completely in hock to the banks? Gordon Brown, particularly in Teddy Bear, had this bizarre notion that they could only spend on public services through a sort of trickle down from the global banks. Um, and anything they gave us, thank you, thank you, rather than you know, you pay your taxes and, and, and you work more properly. Um, so we've had a, an absolute political hegemony that hasn't challenged any of these values um, uh, until now, and I'm not particularly optimistic that, that they will be. Okay, well, we've had a, a fabulous discussion. I'm afraid we've run out of time. 
Uh, both the authors uh, will be sticking around for a few minutes more. Um, they've got their books here. Uh, the signature, I've also got <laughs> my books, the Oxford Literary Festival, thank you. Uh, so I'm happy to sign those as well and discuss them, which are on globalization and related topics. But I think it's been absolutely fabulous, and uh, I really do want to thank all of you for coming and uh, our authors for being here and sharing their thoughts with Katrina and John. Thank you. Thank you.